one of, the, one of the things that I did at the start of this particular lesson was I wanted to do a word study uh, through the various appearances in the New Testament of the word courage or encourage or encouragement. Now, there are at least three different words in our New Testaments that are used in that respect in the sense in which we think of the term encouragement. Uh, but the word that appears most often uh, with regard to the, to the appearance of encouragement is also found as consolation or help. And the word is the word paraclete. The original word is paraclete. It comes from two different words, para and kaleo. Para meaning alongside, parallel lines or lines that are alongside. A parable is a story with a parallel, you know, that, that tells one thing and there's a parallel meaning along the side of it, a spiritual meaning. Uh, and so, uh, but in connection with the word, it means to call someone close to your side. And then kaleo is to call or to exhort or encourage. But the word generally means to comfort or give consolation. Now, when we think of comfort and consolation, we think of illness, death in the family, some type of personal setback. Uh, but the Bible doesn't use that terminology exclusively in that context. And so I wanted us to understand that there's going to be some different words that are used, and some are very, very one of the words uh, that we're going to look at in, in a moment only appears one time in the whole New Testament, and and so and and the other one only a handful of times. And so I want you to understand that when we'll read, you know, as the course goes along, we'll read a number of texts, and uh, and through the reading of these texts, we will uh, we'll see words like. Exhortation, consolation, uh, encouragement. Um, well, the, the Holy Spirit is called the Helper in John 14, 26, 15, 26, uh, 16, somewhere in the first four verses. The word Helper. Uh, that word is also paraclete. In other words, the Holy Spirit is called a Helper. And I think it means, in that sense, Helper. I don't think there's anything hidden about what Jesus is talking about in that sense. And so, but when I think about encouragement, you know, I think about something almost completely different. Like I think about, you know, I think about maybe somebody, you know, in a weight room, you know, and he's trying to, you know, he's trying to max out on a bench press or, or, or some type of uh, weight lifting and, and, and we shout words of encouragement, you know, to that person or in some type of athletic endeavor, we shout words uh, of of encouragement uh, when you've got a little little kid on the edge of the pool and he's afraid to jump in, you know these you're getting you're trying to encourage them. Well, what do you, and in that case, what are we trying to get them to do? Overcome their fear to do something that they can do if they're willing to set aside their fear and act in faith in the person who's encouraging them. So that's what I think of when I think about encouragement. And so I don't want us to get too bogged down in the, in the minutia of the words, but I just want you to understand there's a lot of different Bible uses of the word encouragement. And so that, and so that we're not always talking about the same thing. And I mention that because I want us to make sure that we use the words in the right way as they appear in the text. You know, we can always... You know, we always want to be on the guard. We can teach the right thing, and, but use the wrong verse to teach a right thing. And that's not good. You know, we want to teach the right thing and use the right verse to teach the right thing. And so that's kind of where I'm starting with this, because it starts with the power of courage. The power of courage. When we think about encouragement. You know, it's almost like, it to, you know, encouragement is like the word infuse in my mind. You know, is to put something in you. You know, to encourage is to put courage into a person. That's what I think about as I think about this, this concept. And this is very important in this opening line on page 28 
where it says, Paul makes a statement to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1 7. It says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now, no, not fear, but power. Not fear, but love. Not fear, but a sound mind. Now, what is the context of that statement? Well, let's, let's, roll, back, let's roll back a few verses. And we can start in verse 3 where Paul says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. And, I, and always in every prayer of mine, uh, 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 making requests for you, for your fellowship in the gospel. And, and so, or not, that's Philippians chapter 1, in, in uh, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, he's talking about uh, the faith that was in his grandmother and his mother in verse 5. And then in verse 6, he talks about the gift that he had. So apparently Paul had laid hands on Timothy and had, and had uh, endowed him with certain spiritual gifts. The problem was Timothy was not exercising those gifts for whatever reason. Well, I think we know the reason. He was afraid. For some reason, Timothy was afraid to, be, to do the work that Paul had commissioned him to do or that God through Paul had commissioned him to do. And so that's why he said, verse 7, God's not given us a spirit of fear. You know, Timothy, what are you afraid of? You know, wh why, would you be, why would you be afraid to do what God has commissioned you to do? Especially if, if we understand, if we understand that, that the gifts that Timothy had would have been miraculous in nature. Nevertheless, you know, this, type, this type of fear could, uh, could overcome even a spirit-filled individual. Uh, Jesus warned about this very thing in uh, Matthew chapter 10. He was telling His disciples to go and preach. He says, What I whisper in your ear, you shout from the rooftops. And He says, And do not fear those that can kill the body but can do no more harm, but rather fear Him who can kill both body and soul in hell. And then He gives not only this admonition, but a statement of, what I would say, encouragement. For the very hairs of your head are numbered. You know, not a single sparrow falls to the ground, but what your Heavenly Father doesn't know it. In other words, you're going to have gifts. You're going to have abilities, miraculous abilities. But in spite of that, you're still going to be subject to, to fear. And you're still going to be subject to all the, the entrapments of fear. But what is the statement of encouragement? God's with you. God is with you. And so I think about that in that regard of encouragement. And I think that's exactly what Paul's telling Timothy uh, here in this letter. You have these gifts. You have a work to do. For some reason, you've, you've fallen prey to fear. And in essence, what you've done is you've forgotten that God is with you. And so Paul says uh, in verse uh, 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 7 again, um, God has not given us a spirit of fear. Again, but of power. All right? Of love. And then the last one is a sound mind. Sound mind. In other words, why would anybody who has God on his side be fearful? In other words, you don't have any reason to be afraid. You know, what did Paul say to the Romans in Romans, 1, 31, or Romans 8, 31 and 32? If God is for us, who can be against us? By the way, in my study, of doing my word studies for this lesson uh, tonight, I wanted to look at a lot of the words that had to do with the idea of being afraid. You would not believe... If you could do, if you went home and you had that access, like if you had, you had, if you opened up a Strong's Concordance, or you searched online and you looked up how many times Moses used the word heart, fear, and afraid in the Book of Deuteronomy, you say, "Well, what's so significant about the Book of Deuteronomy?" Well, it was the last thing Moses said to the people before they had to go to war. And take possession of the promised land. And so it was very important for Moses to continually encourage them. 
They're, and he warned them up front. He goes, look, there's more of them than there are of you. Don't be afraid. God is with you. you know, the Anakim are there. The giants. Don't be afraid. God is with you. you know, don't let your heart fail. You know, don't be afraid. And so over and over again, uh, Moses is encouraging the people, admonishing, admonishing them not to be afraid, encouraging them not to be fearful, but to go in and possess the land that God had promised, because if God had promised it to them, He would deliver it. And so over and over again, of power and of love and of a sound a sound mind. Now in the second paragraph, this is interesting, I thought... Uh, um, thought says don't encourage or don't confuse courage with recklessness you know there are a lot of people that are reckless they're daredevils that's not necessarily courage now you can you can overcome fear like look when uh, when evil Knievel jumped the fountains at Caesar's palace on that motorcycle back in the day you know that took that took a lot of courage but but that guy was basically a daredevil in other words, he he could do he could do the math and see that he could do what he had att attempted to do. You know what I mean by that? No, all the mathematics were laid out. You know, I watched a guy several years ago on New Year's Eve. I actually stayed up till nearly midnight one New Year's Eve. I would I never do that. And I watched a guy jump a motorcycle up on top of the Arc de Triomphe in in Las Vegas. I mean, that joker jumped, I mean, it was like straight up 70 or 80 feet. And he didn't have very far to stop that thing when he got on top. And he, he put that thing right up in the air and right on top of that arc and shut her down right there. And then in my, and I'm thinking, well, that's pretty cool. <laughs> How are you going to get down? <laughs> and he rode that motorcycle and he, he rode that motorcycle off that thing back onto the ramp that he come up on. And I thought, boy, you crazy. He, he was right, he was right. I don't know what Red Bull paid him, but it wasn't near enough. <laughs> it wasn't near enough. But, uh, you know, but that guy's a daredevil. You know, in other words, they had already sat down and figured out how fast he needed to go when he hit the ramp, you know, all the things that needed to be in place. Courage is the ability to overcome when there's somebody working against you. And you and you don't have the numbers figured out. You, know, you haven't sat that you haven't sat down and, and done all the ciphering ahead of time you know, to see if you've got what it takes. Courage is when you're able to overcome overt opposition or uh, 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 persecution when everything hasn't been figured out ahead of time. And so I, I thought it was a good point for him to make that that being a daredevil or reckless is not the same uh, as having as having courage. Now. Um, let me see here. Let me. All right, I'm going to hold off on the definitions real quick. Look over on. Let's turn over to page uh, 28. Now it speaks in the very last, in the very last breath, in essence, that Moses uh, spoke to Joshua. Uh, you know, it says, "Be strong and of good courage." Do not fear or be afraid of them, for the Lord your God, He is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. And so, you know, Moses understood. And by the way, Moses spoke from a position of experience. Right? I mean, could Moses, could Moses in all good conscience, with absolute certainty, tell Joshua, God will be with you. Now, did Moses know exactly what Joshua was going to face? Did he know what did he know what was laid out before him? No. Nope. But could he say with absolute confidence to, to Joshua, "Don't be afraid, because it is God who goes before you." He could say that. Did Moses have any experience in that? What kind of experience did he have, Walter? All right, when he went up on the mountain, stayed 40 days. All right, so he had experience, a personal yeah. experience with God. Then he, uh, when he, well, it said speak to the rock. One time he spoke. Yeah. The next time he 
went further than what God told him to. Right. But what about what about but what about speaking to the matter of courage? To, to, to speak to the matter of telling Joshua to, to have courage. Did Moses have any experience in that regard? Well, he went to Pharaoh. Ah, now you're on to something. He went to Pharaoh, the most powerful man on the planet. And he said, thus says the Lord God, let my people go. Now, did Pharaoh immediately do that? No. What did he say? Y'all remember what he said? Right out, right out of the box? Who is the Lord that I should obey His voice? I do not know the Lord, and I ain't letting Israel go. Now, I'm sure that really wasn't the response that Moses was hoping for. But nevertheless, that's what happened. And then, which led to what? The plagues. And, And really, what were the plagues designed to do? To show Pharaoh who was God. And to show the people of Israel who, who was God. And that the God of Israel was more powerful than all the gods of Egypt. Because you can go back and you can study all of those plagues. And every one of those plagues dealt expressly with one of the primary gods of Egypt. You have, for example, Ra was the sun god. Alright? Do we have any instance of a plague that showed God's power over the sun? Darkness covered the land. In fact, it was so dark, nobody got out of their house. So, God God exerts His power over Ra. You know, Ra is your primary god. And our God just made your God go to sleep for a little while. What about the Nile River? The God of the Nile River. Um, uh, you, you, then you have the God of the earth. And the earth, you know, you know lice. And, and, all, and, all, and all the things uh, of, the, of cattle. The, you know, the boils. All these things that... that, that uh, the, even the frogs were, uh, were a part of the Egyptian uh, deities. And God exerted His power over all of them. All of them. In other words, God can make frogs come up and God can kill them when He got ready. And so, all of these, all of these plagues were designed to show Israel and Pharaoh and Egypt in general that there was, but one, there was but one true God and it was the God who was telling Pharaoh to let the people go. Which was why in the end, the Egyptians... <coughs> They just piled the silver and gold on the people and said, "Look, take everything you can, you know, take everything you can hold and get out of here." And the Bible says they plundered the Egyptians. They plundered them. And so, so here's Moses speaking to Joshua, telling him not to be afraid. By the way, once once Pharaoh let him go, then what happened? Changed his mind. And then what happened? Well, they started chasing them. Yeah, he started chasing them, and then the Red Sea was parted. And Israel went across on dry land, and Egypt's army got covered up in water and drowned. I mean, over and over again. Uh, by the way, what a, how did God show His presence to the Israelites during the 40-year wilderness wandering? Well, yeah, he gave food, the, 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 the manna, the quail. How else? How did he show them he was with them? Pillar of fire at night and a pillar of cloud during the day. Everybody could see it all the time. And they knew that was a sign of the presence of God. And when that cloud or that fire moved, they moved. And when it stopped, they stopped. But they could see it all the time as a testimony to the presence of God. And so Moses had... an an unbelievable amount of experience to tell Joshua, don't be afraid. You know, we just, you know, w- you know, we've been in the wilderness for 40 years and, and, and most everybody that left Egypt is dead. But, you know, y- you remember what happened in Egypt. You still remember. And so, uh, and so you have uh, Moses encouraging, encouraging uh, Joshua. 
All right, then secondly, on page 28, in the first full paragraph, um, talks about Daniel. And Daniel has, uh, uh, is used as a, an example of courage rooted in a right relationship with God. And it, you know, it talks about uh, you know, he was taken captive to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar, grappled with uh, fears while adjusting to his new life. Uh, but refused to be dominated by despair. Now, I want, to, I want to make a note about something here just for a moment. And that is, Daniel already had a leg up among the people when he got to Babylon. If you go and you'll read Daniel chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Daniel, and then we know him as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Their name was Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. That was their Hebrew name. The other names that we know, the names that we know them by are the names that were given to them when they got to Babylon. But those boys were hand selected. They were hand selected because they, first of all, were the sons of nobility. They were already educated. No, and, and we might say they already knew how to learn. You know, it's pretty important learning how to learn. Right? And so they were already educated. They knew how to learn. Also, the text says in verse 4, they were good looking. They were handsome. There was no, ble there was no physical blemishes in, in them. And so these guys, you uh, know, in a, in a before, before the carrying away, these guys already had a leg up so far as being an average Jew, which to me makes their faithfulness to God that much more impressive. I mean, look at, look at what happens in our world today when some 18, 19, 20 year old kid who can, you know, put a basketball in a hoop or, you know, or hit a ball, hit a baseball 500 feet or, you know, a, you know, can play football. You know, you know what what happens. You know what happens to athletes that are are young and highly successful. What ends up happening to them? Well, they like get colleges recruit, and if they do good in college, they get NFL. Yeah, they get special privileges. That's right. They're 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 spe they get special privileges that every kid that most kids don't get. They get attention. Uh, uh, they get people looking the other way when they do things. And so to me, that makes Daniel and the other three even more impressive that despite where they were among the, the Hebrew hierarchy, they were still extremely faithful to God. And when you think about what happened when they got to Babylon, that the Bible says Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's food. That's, that's, a, great, that's a great statement about him. And, and apparently, even though it's only said of him, it also applied to those other three. And he said, give us vegetables and water to eat. And the, king of the, or the head of the eunuch said, well, wait, no. He said, if I do that, you're going to look poorly after about ten days and the king's going to have my head. And Daniel said, what? Just give us a test. Just, just, just ten days. Just give us ten days. And so he agreed. And at the end of ten days, what happened? They looked better. They looked better. And the Bible seed says they were smarter. They looked better and they were smarter. Now, how do you reckon that happened? Obeying God. Obeying God. Obeying God. But by the way, it took courage for them to do that. Look, they were a long way from home. Right? Well, you, that king over there, he had the power to put them to death. That's right. They were a long way from home. And, and it would have been easy for them just to go along, with the, go along with the plan. By the way, who's going to know? I'm 800 miles from home. I'm not even. I'm not even living with my people. I'm living. I'm living in the king's palace, or in special quarters. And yet, you know, don't we find? Don't we find that happens a lot with young people? For example, they get in the military, they get a long way from home, or college, they get a long way from home, and then they abandon. They abandon their spiritual and moral moorings, 
and they they pursue. You know, it's easy. It's easier just to go with the flow and be like everybody else. But Daniel and and the three the three Hebrew brethren, that wasn't what they were about. And so, it took I think a great deal of courage on their part to do what they did. Uh, and I think where they started, to, to me personally, makes it even more even makes it more uh, imp- impressive. All right, at toward the bottom of. Uh, no, not toward the bottom, toward the middle, where the first paragraph, there's two, there's a paragraph that starts with courageous, and the one above begins with courage. I want you to start right there. Courage. It says, courage is a divine resource needed by all people. It's not reserved for prophets and police officers. The lives of ordinary people may not be as glamorous as those in high risk or high profile occupations, but their need for strength to deal with the day-to-day struggles is no Less real. I'm gonna stop right there. Just I'm gonna stop right there. Just for, uh, just for a second, and and uh, and remind us. I believe it was I believe it was uh, JFK who made a statement to the effect of, you know, those those who, in the terms of military service, uh, gave all were very courageous. But those who survived and continued to live, their courage is to also be commended. You think about you know guys that, that you know that see what a lot of you know people saw, you know over there, and so you know yeah, it takes courage to, to to serve your country and it takes courage to give your life, but it also takes courage to go serve your country and come home. That's right, and so what what uh, what. Uh, uh, Brother Johnson's saying here is, is that in essence, courage is needed every single day. We need courage every single day, depending on what our life situation is. Uh, Cookie and I talked on Sunday, and I knew I knew as soon as I put it in the bulletin, Cookie is going to talk to me about uh, my good friend Drew Kaiser, Andy's oldest son. You know, he's in his early to mid forties. You know, battling Parkinson's. Well, you know, Cookie's husband battled Parkinson's for a long, long time. But when I typed it, I knew Cookie was going to latch on to that if she read it, and she did. And we talked about, we talked about that. Well, you know, it takes courage, you know, to to continue to do the type of work that uh, that Bill did and the type of work that Drew does. Although they're very different, a coal miner and a preacher, but but still both. You know, to overcome the adversities that, that life throws... You know, every day when they wake up, they got to muster up the courage to do what they need to do every single day. And, and you don't have to have some debilitating disease to need courage. You know, cancer patients need courage. You know, people with COPD uh, need courage. People that are, uh, people that are struggling to, to, to find work or, or keep a roof over their head need courage. You know, people that have... Have high stress jobs need courage. You know, I mean, courage is something that is required of us just about every single day in a lot of different ways. And we don't want to think that the need for courage is just like the kind that David had to go out and fight the lion. You know, there's little giants that we got to fight. You know, there's, there's little giants we got to fight every single day. If I might use an oxymoron. <laughs> A little giant, but you understand, you understand what I mean. And so, courage is needed by everyone. Look, uh, uh, says uh, where it says uh, the day-to-day struggles no less real. Look, it takes courage to discipline children in a permissive society. It takes resolve to decline lucrative job opportunities that infringe on family life. Uh, it takes nerve or courage. Uh, to seek fulfillment as a homemaker in, in a world that says that you know women can't be all that they can, you know, without having a career. Uh, by the way, um, you know, most of y'all know that I'm a big fan of Jordan Peterson, uh, you know, the psychologist from Toronto, and he's kind of a rock star in the world of of, uh, of political correctness and philosophy. But, but Peterson made the statement, and and he was not very popular for making it, but he said. He said the biggest lie that's been perpetrated on, on women in Western civilization is that you can't be all that you can be if you're just a mother. 
And he says that, you know, the evidence, the evidence says that, that you know, the, the, lack of, the lack of full-time mothers has hurt our society. And so, uh, and so, and by the way, Peterson claims to be an atheist. Or at the very least, an agnostic. I think deep down he's a believer. He just, he just doesn't have the courage to come out and say it because I think he's afraid that if he ever admits that he believes in God, people are going to dis, you know, discount him as a, you know, some, kind of, some kind of kook. But, you know, but just, from a purely, uh, just from a purely scientific standpoint, he says, he says you know, the, effect, the effects of this have not been good on Western society. And that's, like I said, that's strictly from a scientific uh, uh, standpoint. And so, you know, to have the courage to be a, a homemaker. Uh, then next paragraph. Courageous men and women, endure, bear up, tough it out, keep on keeping on. Um, um, then go down a little bit, a line and a half. Courage is what it takes to follow through on goals despite hardships or difficulties. Uh, encourages students to study when they'd rather play. Empowers athletes to work out when they'd rather sleep in. Inspires dieters to eat sensibly when they'd rather indulge. Uh, impressive displays of courage are exhibited every day in the lives of regular people. Now, I cordoned that off and I thought, I don't know if that is so much courage as it is discipline. And I think there's a difference between courage and discipline. You know, I don't think it takes courage to put the ice cream down. All right? It takes discipline. <laughs> All right. Now there may be there may be some there may be some correlation between discipline and courage, but most of the things that I thought about uh, that he listed in that list were discipline or, or it matters of discipline. But go to page twenty nine. First full paragraph where it says it's, where it says what it takes backbone. He's talking about courage. It takes courage to walk down the aisle and request to be baptized or the prayers of the congregation. It requires courage, boldness for a Christian to share his faith with friends and co-workers. It takes metal, that is courage, uh, to contend for the faith against false teaching. Courage makes it possible for an individual to stand up for what he believes even when it is unpopular. I quoted that one off and capital I wrote, this is courage. The other is discipline. This is courage. You know, to, to, it takes courage to go against the flow, to go against the grain uh, when, when society or religion or whatever is in the wrong. Um, he says, The difference between courage and fear is in the direction. Courage implies positive forward movement. Fear suggests negative movement or failure to move at all. And when I saw that, my mind immediately went to uh, when I when I hear or think about the phrase paralyzing fear. One of my favorite movies of all time, Saving Private Ryan. I think it's one of the best movies ever made. In the course of that movie, and it's on end of the film, there's a guy there, and he's not really a soldier. He's kind of a, a I don't remember if he was like a medic or some type of of, 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 of a war reporter or something. But in the course of that, that movie. There's an American soldier and a German soldier in hand-to-hand -hand combat in, on the second floor of this building. And they are fighting. You know, one of them is walking out alive and the other one will be dead. They are fighting to the death. And I mean, you can hear it. I mean, they're bouncing off walls. I mean, there's punching. There's, there's hollering. There's screaming. There's eye gouging. There's everything going on. And this little guy is about three steps outside the door holding a gun. Paralyzed with fear. And while he stands there paralyzed with fear, that German kills his companion. And then just walks out and walks down the steps past him and walks, walks right out of the building. I see Sean nod. You, if, if you've seen the movie, you have to remember that scene. That's all he did. Right. That guy didn't even have a gun. The guy walked out, didn't even have a gun. But he stood there paralyzed with fear while one of his companions got killed. Now look, I know that's fiction. But it, it, exemplify, it exemplifies the danger of fear. That fear gets people killed. 
You know, and, and, and fear keeps us from intervening when we really need to intervene. You know, when it's a matter of life and death or when it's a matter of heaven and hell. And so you know, I, I just wrote that right down. I wrote that down. Saving Private Ryan, paralyzed with fear. I, listen, it makes me mad to even think about that scene. I've probably seen that movie 20 times. You know, and even to think about it to this day, that scene still makes me angry. And I know it didn't really happen. Just, but it just, it just makes me extremely angry to, th- to think about it. So I'm going to quit thinking about it. And so then next Wednesday, we'll start with attitudes. <laughs> you know, I don't even remember that. I'm so mad at him about, after that. I'd... <laughs>